Brought to you by New Greens. Hello and welcome to Midlife Health Moments with myself and Mr. Todd Richards. We are so excited because today we have a guest that I've been wanting to talk to, well, pretty much since I ever started surfing. For the past 23 years, I feel like he's one of the most influential surfers on the planet when it comes to equipment, pushing the limits, big waves, and just being an overall awesome person. If we had cowboys in the world of surfing, this would be Clint Eastwood, but he is actually the real deal. Our guest today is the one and only Mr. Nathan Fletcher. Thank you so much for being here. We're stoked to have you. Wow, thank you. <laughs> That's our intro, dude. <laughs> yeah. okay. No pressure. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, uh, so I'm here for the midlife talk. Oh, I'm spitting on myself. How old are you now? 46, and so that means what, you're 52? 52, would be 52 in December, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you're 51. It sucks getting old, huh? So how, uh, <laughs> well, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, okay, like, when did I meet Todd? And I was like, huh, I just remember, like, you doing Andrecht inverts, like, at Copper Mountain. It was 1990 <laughs> yeah. when I met you and your brother and Greg Tomlinson, and I forget who else was traveling with that circus. I think your dad no, was we filming. Came earlier to the Copper Mountain contest when I was like, uh, what was it? It was like an OP contest. Yeah, yeah, that was 1990. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we've been on a freaking skateboard, surfboard, snowboard ride for a really long time. And, uh, you know, it's just shit don't work like it used to. We were, right. just, we were having a discussion out there about, you know, your ailments. You've got some shit going on with your leg, right? You know, it's been ongoing. It's interesting, yeah, you hurt, you're in pain, and it just doesn't heal anymore like it did, I feel like. So three weeks is three months. Like a 20-year-old is three weeks, bam, boom. Like, I mean, three days you're on it, it still hurts for three weeks. Now it's like you're out for three weeks and it hurts for three months. So but, you, you snapped your femur at pipe during a cutback. Did you have a previous injury to that femur, or was that just from the pressure in that moment during that cutback that it snapped? Um, it was actually just circumstance and uh, because our being Fletchers were super stiff, like our thumbs don't bend. Like my dad had club feet when he was born. Okay. Um, so technically we're very stiff tendon. Um, but it was the way the water hit the bottom of the board, my leg spun, twisted, and then pressed at the same time. And so like I've done all these things where it's like I should have broke my leg. Right. Actually I did when I was three, I broke my leg skin. But uh, anyways, it's like if you hit it straight, it's real strong. If you like, bend it sideways but it's like soon as it has a twist and a pressure is what i feel like what happened it just broke like nothing because i thought i was going to blow my knee up but uh it just broke my leg wow yeah it could have been a life threat well it is a life-threatening injury you got pulled out of the water by the the lifeguards there actually i made it to the beach on my own because i felt like i was going to die because shock was kicking in mm -hmm. but it's interesting because it was definitely like the worst injury or the worst, most traumatic thing to happen to me in my life physically but on the flip side, uh, it really helped. Like it was like the beginning of healing, too, because of going through what I was going through in my personal life and just all these things. It was like boom. It was January third, two thousand nine, and so it was like I needed to break my leg to sit on the bench and watch, see what was important to me, understand, because there had never been a time where I'd like uh, stepped aside from what was going on. Right, you're full speed all the time. How long were you laid up for with that injury? Like well, full rehab? I was, you know, it's, it's a lifetime of recovery, I feel like, because uh, that was the first time anything had happened like that. But I, you know, like, let's say just like substance abuse, uh, all these different things, not really caring for whatever your life's path was and just doing stuff. And so I was out for four months not doing anything like physically out. And then at four months, I started being able to swim and get around and then like, you know, whatever, body surf, uh, cause I started swimming a lot and then longboarding and got into stand up paddling. Um, so it was like probably nine months, but I feel like the biggest waves, some of the biggest paddle and surf that I rode was like on that next year, because that was the year of 2009 and 10. And that's the year like Cyan got those paddling waves in mm -hmm. Himalayas. And so it was like from breaking my leg, it was like, oh, I felt like I had a lot of time off, but then I was like, oh, we had this plan of like riding these big waves. And so uh, coming back, like from that, I rode the biggest waves of my life, like directly after. So 
So going back a little bit, I want to come back to that point around 2009, 2010, 2011. You're originally from Capo Beach, is that yes, correct? Exactly. And obviously, we've we've seen plenty in the past and, and read plenty about your history and your family. When you're coming up, you're also going to Hawaii. And would you say, like, as a kid, the way you were raised was pretty feral, meaning you got to be doing stuff, or did mom and dad have a close eye on you at all times? Well, you know, I'm not going to say it was feral. It's kind of common at this point mm-hmm. in the beginning. Right. Uh, we'll just go back to my brother being in ninth grade and getting in trouble, and there was this thing, and it was called the parent teacher escort. <laughs> and so Christian got in trouble, and uh, my mom had to go to school with him. So that's what the parent teacher escort was. You got to have a parent come to all your classes. Right. So my mom was super bummed, did not want to do it. So she said, Okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to embarrass the shit out of him. Yeah. So she dressed up as best she could with fishnet hose. You know, <laughs> oh my god, dude. She already had like bleached hair and a right. pierced nose. So she went to school and obviously like caused such a seat. It was a real problem. So anyways, once she went there, she realized that she was not really into what was going on in school. Christian wasn't learning. They couldn't mm-hmm. get the class to be quiet. Then they'd give it all to him in homework. So that ended parent-teacher comp- or escort, by the way. That was done. She went, she took Christian out of school from there. He was in ninth grade. Sent him to a different school. as like a continue, not a continuation school, like a, a Pathfinders. It was like, you know. Yeah. He already did the continuation school, but it was homeschooling, we'll say. So then I was still in school, and then my mom just wasn't really into it. So in seventh grade, because I had a great teacher, Kirk Page was the best teacher you could ever have. He surfed with me and made me tapes and, like, in the music and that's a good best teacher guy. yeah super good he's still the judge at like surf contest he judged the Mavs contest um he's still my great friend i went and saw him like the last year before he retired anyways kurt page ruined it for me because he was so great and i went to seventh grade and it was just different you know yeah starts oh like, yeah seventh grade is six like, to seventh grade it's like the kids change you mm-hmm. know? so it's like they start creasing their pants and wearing like, <laughs> whatever it is so my mom said we're over school all it's gonna I don't want you to go to school because I don't want you around the people I'd rather have you go outside and play and go do other things travel you can go to the same school Christian went to uh, go to home school because she felt that it was gonna have, or teach me how to cheat steal and lie if I kept going to school so that was um, she sounds like she was ahead of her time yeah because dude, that totally. is the Southern California norm now when it comes to skating surfing snowboarding kids are homeschooled or they go once a week but back in the day, that was kind of... It was that illegal, was some, actually. Yeah. You didn't have it, uh, you know, so there was things you had to do to be so it was illegally done. And you're spending your winters in Hawaii at, yeah. at, from a very young age. Um, well, since about like eight or nine. Eight or nine. We'd go there. I mean, I definitely went there before that, but uh, like, it, like just going to the pipe house and that, that's what I remember. And did you have a, at that age, your teen years, did you have... A number one as far as love, skating, surfing, playing speed metal, playing guitar, surfing. <laughs> uh, Is there you know anything? I, mean? uh, I just want to say, like, I loved it all and just like everybody should. And so I was, grew up in surfing. My whole, you know, family's involved in surfing. And so when I was like 12 years old, uh, we got to go snowboarding because snowboarding was happening. And so because Gary McNabb and Sonny Miller and those guys... It was the Varney Vertical. Era, yeah, so but it's no summit. It's yep. no summit. So because Sonny Miller was a surfer now, he met us up there and gave us uh, some nectar snowboards, and we snowboarded. And so there was just something about snowboarding, I feel like, at that time, and been surfing forever. And so it was like this whole new thing, but all of a sudden skateboarders started snowboarding. And it was like, a, I don't know, it was just a different time, and it felt like everybody was... It was like even the music was changing. Yeah, it changed then because I remember like when when we first met, it was like you would either you got on Gotcha like the next year. Yeah. Like I was on Gotcha, and then you got on Gotcha, and then all of a sudden Gotcha was like, oh, we're gonna like be into skating now because Nathan skates, and I was like so hyped on that that it was more of like a well-rounded thing because there wasn't at that point there wasn't really well-rounded like board sport people. It was like you could maybe do two, but there wasn't too many that could actually do all three. And that was an interesting thing too, even going to that, like even saying, like seeing Danny Way in the beginning, like I saw him do things on snowboards because of his skating. Like I saw him do the first inverted 
uh, yeah. the pipe McTwist that I ever saw anybody do. And um, and it's like you're saying, it was because of his skateboarding, but it was like these people, you know, like even like Hasoy and Duncan. And I remember going snowboarding with a whole group of people and then it'd be like Zabo and Victor Coin, just random groups of people. But, right. But it was like a new, fresh vibe. And I feel like because of that, I veered towards that. And I really like that because surfing was like, a, in my opinion, it was just kind of a stale time in surfing and the mm -hmm. personalities and uh, the culture and coming and then seeing like skateboarding, you know, like Hasoy and Gator and just all these crazy people that were uh, influential, you know, in the time. And well, so I feel like surfing started all that and then these people like took it and all of a sudden new stuff started happening. So I feel like I went with that, but surfing is who I am and what I do and all. Like if I go snowboarding, I'm a surfer that snowboards. Right, right, right. right. So it's, but the, at the same time, then it became an Olympian sport and just totally changed. Too. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's just everything more. It's a quick window. But the, the, the thing that I think is, is consistent, especially like where you, where you come in and fit into this piece of the puzzle is like all of these sports starting, like you're saying about Danny, like they start influencing each other. Right. And I mean, it's no secret in the surf industry, like when you and your brother and just your, like the family came into surfing and brought more of like that skate vibe into it, there was a lot of people that were like, no, yeah, like they're, this, they're, this doesn't fit in our little small box. But those are the people that don't remember that if surfing came from skate or skateboarding came from surfing. So it's, it's hard to like, if you're a yeah. surfer, be like, oh yeah, I just skate like even like when the whole street. And so it's totally a mentality, but it's taken these other people like even current cables or yeah. um, different people that are cool skating, Pedro Barros to like, oh, we're going on a surf trip. Now it's like everybody's like, oh. Yeah, everyone does everything now. Yeah. Like there's no, right. like no one gets any shit anymore about anything. But they should because that's like the full fun factor. And so it's like, if you're not having fun or the worst is thinking you're better than somebody while they're having a great time. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, you're pointing a finger while the guy's just having a good time. Like, oh. Yeah, that's a solid, yeah. solid, Guilt, solid, solid charged. hold the mirror up to somebody he is like, correct. he's having yeah. the time of his life and you're over here just talking shit on him on, on the beach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look how much fun he's I know, <laughs> man. So you, the first time I became aware of you, I'm seeing you doing the motocross. You, did you end up like getting to do like ride in the beginning at Anaheim at Supercross? Um, well, that was like this weird situation, but it was at the LA Coliseum actually. LA Coliseum. And it was okay. just because the other guys couldn't do it because they're factory riders and they're all paid and so they couldn't go out and like uh, just go jump around and do that. So because Milo and SMP, he put us in there and so I just went because I, I could. Right. But I did race some AMA races, and it was because I knew the Peters, Mark and Sandra, and so we forged all my credentials and said that I'd won like all these. Uh, <laughs> Very, <laughs> very experienced, very successful. Yeah. So around that time too, like I'm seeing you in the magazines and there's Think Fast. Right. Was yeah. your, and I would see like, they'd have a picture of you snowboarding, like in the pipe, skating, and then there'd be surfing. And I would see that. And then we sort of didn't hear about you in surfing until 1998 at the Gotcha Pro. Yeah. And my, I've always wondered, and I would love to know, how much were you surfing going into this contest? It's in Tahiti at a wave at the time that really the public hadn't seen one of the gnarliest waves in the world. And really how much had yeah. you been surfing when you, and how, just tell me that whole story, how you even got in that contest. Oh and, man, it's a long one and hard to remember. Uh, well, just, <laughs> <laughs> well, you get <laughs> that shit, that, that, that to me uh, changed your trajectory in 98 as you know, your trajectory changed, changed it, later. It, just as well as it did again. Yep. Uh, so yeah, no, Tahiti has been, had two life changing moments for me. And the reason, so the reason I got to go to the first one was because I rode for Gotcha, mm -hmm. but it was the second time around on Gotcha. Uh, and it was because Kenny Jacobs, he was the French part and they were going to do some like motocross stuff. So they sponsored me for surfing and motocross, but I'd just been riding. Uh, anyways, so they were going to have this contest cause they had one prior and I ended up going to that. It was like the black pearl. It was in 96, I believe. And then, uh, the next year was going to be the first WQS, uh, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, gotcha. France was going to be putting it on. So I rode for Gotcha France. So they're like, oh, do you want to go to the Tahiti contest? And I was like, yeah, because I went there a year prior. So I had been surfing a little bit um, on and off, like borrowing boards. Like I'd go get a trade in from uh, Corey Lopez or go to Lost and go get. But you had been like surfing reef breaks, heavy waves. Yeah, but Chopa is not like one of those waves that you can like 
not be surfing that's and then, like, what i'm go saying and get into it no but i was at a point in my life and so my whole thing was like oh if you could just go jump a triple with like 20 guys next to you and not even really be like a pro rider and just be faking it like it's then, casual if you, like, yeah crash it's like oh you're just breaking stuff like this was like okay i've done it all my life and then i was going through uh uh, my first midlife crisis, which was getting divorced and like working, because that's what I did. I worked and for my dad and packed boxes. And so I was at a point where I was just like make it or break it, and uh, I had no cares on my mind. And so I was going, and so I started in the first heat of the trials, and I said, okay, if I make it through the second heat of the trials, I'm going to try and become a uh, pro surfer. And if I don't, I'm just going to go home and try and patch it up and do that whole thing. And oh, so uh, then I made it to the trials, which was six rounds, made it into the first round of the main event. Then the contest got real big. Yep. And so I had a six five or a seven five. I had two boards and uh, just it, it was just every set was getting bigger. So those guys paddled out, boom, first set of the heat came. Nobody wanted it. And I was on my seven five and got it just got this great wave got a tan kicked out and they're like oh tan blah 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 so i was like oh that's you know i couldn't even believe it i was just in disbelief but then the next set came it was bigger and i was last in position i was kind of in the middle of the pack the first one but nobody wanted the next set either so i was like holy shit and i turned around i'm like you know what i'm going i'm either going to eat shit or get the wave of my life but i just got the wave of my life so i'm just going to eat shit and so then i thought about all these things and i was stuck in the lip and then as I took off, somehow I fumbled in my feet and caught my rail and got it. So it set me up to get a bigger, better, deeper one. Two tens. Two tens. And then yeah. uh, that was like in the first like couple minutes of the heat and then cut. And they still judged three waves in the heat at that point. So got a 7.5. Anyways, all the people were on the boat, like the whole world, and gotcha. You're yeah. that. So boom, right there, I became a pro surfer. I was it. Yeah. I mean, I gotta ask though. It's like Crazy. okay, so you're going through this shit. Like you're going through a divorce. You're like, you know, yeah, I guess so deep in that story. You, re you <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah, skim the surface. Skim the we'll, we'll, you're packing boxes. Just like fuck it. Like I'm, I'm over this. I'm just, you know, racing motocross. Like well, in a like who cares mode. Was it like yeah. going to Tahiti? We just well, like no, fuck like, it. So I would be like, oh, packing boxes with this guy Tony, or just whoever, and then blah blah blah, and then. I was saying something about like my life at home and he's like, man, you're over that. She's mistaken your kindness for a weakness. And I remember I was like, Corey Lopez and the, or it was Shane and he came in to grab boxes so they could go. And I remember just thinking like, I'm packing these guys Astrodeck to, so they can go on surf trips, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you were married young though, right? Yeah, you're yeah, a young yeah. guy at the but time. It was, also, it was like, I don't even know, it's all bullshit, but it was like a range. So you had an arranged marriage? Well, I was just, not arranged, but it was just... Was it Dibby behind this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So you you come back, and it's clear, sort of that... Well, no, my thing was, I started getting paid, so I lost the house, lost the wife, lost everything, and moved into my van and started getting paid by Gotcha. Oh, my so gosh. That's how my first couple of years of my pro career was, was that live. I just live in my car and just travel and just come home to my car and because I could go wherever... Again, right. Gret, you were ahead of your time. Yeah, Even trend, in your van now, it's totally yeah. rad. <laughs> Everyone does it. But you come back, and I mean, just from, again, not knowing you, and from, from that moment on, I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember I read an interview where you were kind of like, this is what I am. I'm a surfer. I do all these other things, but like, it seemed like it's in your blood. And you know what? That is in my blood, and the reason, the thing is, like, for me, I love to have fun, and I think my dad loved to have fun. Right. And that's why, like, if you're not having fun, like, my dad's biggest line is, look at uh, the guy having the most fun is riding the most waves. True. It doesn't matter what you're riding the guy, and then it's like, okay, the guy having the most fun riding the most waves, he's learning how to surf the fastest, too. True. So it doesn't matter what you look like on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're out there watching guys pass you, you're bummed. Yeah. So... It always comes back to fun. So it's like, oh, if you're not surfing, what are you doing? Like, oh, you can go skateboard and have fun. It's like, so when I was young, snowboarding started and it was like a whole new thing. So it was fun. And so my whole true thing is I've never conformed to any sort of contest or tour or competitive route or anything. I've just stuck to uh, having fun and fall in. You know, it's not that I don't try hard because I do really try hard and I'm really passionate about it. So in those senses, it's not like, oh, this guy on tour is like, has, you know, uh, and just so somehow luckily I followed my heart and in the end it's paid off like just to be myself. And so it's like, uh, 
to try and go beat a bunch of people to qualify for something to get paid it's like that's great like most people have to do that and and getting in that contest did make my life and then the other one was like winning the double xl which was totally by accident and it's a contest that everybody in the whole world's on all the time and it just matter what day or wherever so somehow i won that too you know but it wasn't right. like i went to some place yeah like, you weren't like heats yeah. heats after heat and so like i believe in the competitive format i really like it from kids like oh yeah to try and you know to strive for stuff but for some reason i haven't done that like say in my adult life i have done things and they have been great but then there, i've had super terrible times like at mavericks when it's been really big and like get my dad to drive up there, get him on the boat, and it's almost go on the biggest way, and then almost go on, but just don't, you know what I mean? Where you're just like, yeah. oh. And so, we don't see that in the, we see what they choose to take photos of or write about. Right, so. but like in your heart, like that's a day you like want to catch your biggest way, but it's like, oh no, like, so when you go to try and want and all those things um, with your desire, it just, it kind of will always let you down. Right. And so, my whole thing is if, if you just know that you're doing it because you love it and you're just not giving up, then whatever is right is supposed to happen. Love that. So, like, you kind of can't really force it even though you've tried a million times and every time you try, it's like you kind of get the same result. It was a great try. Yeah. But it's like when you try, 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 and then just kind of let it go and just do your thing, it's like, oh, then you just kind of like, it just falls into place, I feel like. So, so those first, the first decade of the 2000s, you're, you're starting, you're a pro surfer for the first time in your life. You're getting shots in the mag, not the first time in your life, but you're getting shots in the magazines. You've, you've been in big waves since you were a kid. You surfed, what, YMA when you were 12 or maybe even before that. Did you always enjoy juice, big waves? What is it about that that just well, does it for you? Uh, yeah, I'm a thrill seeker for sure, and I always have been uh, in that sense. But like my brother, he was a technical guy, right? Right. And so he could always do everything. He was a trickster. Um, just that's who he is. And then there, and so for me, the only way I could do it was like, okay, if, uh, just to have the balls to do shit. Yeah. So was it like you almost like were forced to like, I don't want to be my brother? Yeah, I never and wanted to do airs. I always thought, oh, that was lame. I wanted to do turns and surf big waves, and and then like as you, you know what I mean, because. He was like that. Oh, he, it was like, and then in my family, it was like, oh, they'd sit around and be like, oh, here he goes, watch Eric Cowell. He's going to do some bunny hops and <laughs> all this shit. Would your uncle really bust your chops, like, about, hey, have you even surfed a big wave yet? Have you? Is it your uncle or is it your great Hoffman? Uh, well, it's my uncle and my, and my great uncle and my yeah. grandpa, my aunt. But yeah, no, they, it's not like they would bust my chops, but like, what could, uh, you just can't really claim anything when when somebody's already uh, like, been there, done that. Yeah, yeah, like so when you think you ride big waves and stuff, and then I was like, oh, grandpa, you know, like where was the biggest day you surfed? And he's like, well, probably, mm, I don't know, it was about a mile outside of Green Lanterns, and I'm like, well, Green Lanterns, where's that? And so he's, oh, Macaha was way too big to surf, so we just kept paddling like a mile outside there, and, and then uh, you know. So when he got cleaned up, it was some, I don't even know, you know, it's like, you know. <laughs> so um, you can't really brag or nothing. So when he saw something that he was impressed by, it was like Chopo, he just couldn't believe it, you know? Right. And so it wasn't to do it to impress him or nothing, it's just do it to do it. But the fact is, is like, he can't believe people can ride a wave that's that shaped. But then his comment was, you know what? I don't even care. I'll be able to ride waves like that with virtual reality soon. He's all, I'll be yes. able to have sex so. with Pamela Anderson. I don't even care. So, so if you've seen things go from like before wetsuits, before foam, um, before fins on your surfboard. Yeah. Uh, then see like, it all. When you see something like that, now he's just like thinking, oh, I'm just going to put on goggles and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So during that time too, you're, you're obviously, you're surfing a ton, but the board thing, I need to, to yeah, ask the, the kind of like the, the, the stretch quad thing was like the with, with the indentations on the rail, like all of a sudden Bat that tail. like showed up like out of nowhere. Was that you? Was that like, how, well, how did that whole thing come about? It was me and Cole actually did it in, um, cause Cole's my dear friend and you know, uh, he was my shaper at the time and I liked the speed of a twin fin, but I hated the way it worked, but I liked the initial like downline. So he's like, you know what, let's make you a four fin. And so then I was like, you know what, that sounds good because when we were young, we had this Stussy one that was super good and it's like you heard about him and 
you never really saw them, but you, everybody liked them when they had them before days, right? And they just went away. Like, and they went away, yeah. so they just kind of disappeared. And so I was like, yeah, that sounds good. We should do that. And then he made me this little one with a bat tail because Bolly Joe made me this board and it had a bat tail. So I'm all, you know, let's put a bat tail on it. It just looks like it'll all work because it's funny looking. Mm -hmm. before. And so the first day when I surfed, uh, I surfed teeny little waves, but I did a really good turn for myself and then I did a really good air. And the waves were really small, and I was like, wow, that was really different and felt really good for those days. That way. So I rode a shortboard for a little bit and really, really liked it. And I was going to Hawaii, so I made a 6.8 and a 7.4. Everybody really laughed when I showed up um, to Hawaii with a four fin to surf pipe. But the only two P or the only person when they saw it that didn't laugh was Tom Carroll. Yes. And so then when Tom Carroll saw it, he looked at it and we talked about it and this and that. And then he started telling me how he had one for Sunset. It was his best board. It was a 7-8. He could go anywhere on the wave. And so right there, I was all, see, doesn't even matter if Tom Carroll's into it. I don't care what all these other people say. And so then I'm like, you know what? I really want to see what Michael Ho thinks about it. So I got stretched to make a 9-6 uh, board for Michael Ho, 4 fin because the reason why I cared what Tom Carroll and Michael Ho think is because they've been at the top of surfing since single fin, twin fin, mm -hmm. thruster. They're the only people that know board design. Everybody else, like, they don't really know because they weren't at the top of surfing when single fins were big, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they've seen it, they, they know it, they know the feeling, they saw what surfing progressions went through. So when Michael Ho got it, and he's so picky, he won't, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, he's probably not gonna. But he got on it straight away, went to YMA, and went directly over the falls. <laughs> And then he's like, I love it. <laughs> and so he's on a whole kick and he's all into his fins. It changed his life. It changed like his whole excitement for surfing. So since like, let's say 55, whatever it has been when he got it to like 62, whatever he is, like he hasn't, you know, he surfs every day, changes his fins. That's all he's about is his fins. Um, and so that's been really cool. But that justified my own beliefs because I don't trust my own feelings. And so my true belief is the one great thing that that's brought to surfing is that maybe people don't like four fins or whatever, but I feel like since then everybody's taken notice of their fins and seen the importance of the fin design, uh, the fin placement, mm -hmm. and then obviously how many you have on there um, because your board really rides different, you know, with a and so you can like make a board really good it could you could add a million great shit whatever the combination is and mm -hmm. so um it's not that i did anything first and uh then there's other stuff like the footage of sonny miller has of tom kern in searching for current mm -hmm. at j bay riding a four fin but when you don't know it you're like whoa he was it was some of his best surfing ever and then you're like oh what and so my whole thing was like oh it's gonna make you turn flat they track out there's all these uh, things that you have in your head from childhood memories, but not from my own personal experience, never playing with a fin design and placement myself. And so I just feel like for some people, there's great benefits that a four fin will give you. And then there's drawbacks just like anything. Yeah. So some people like them, some waves, they like them. Some people don't like them. And, um, and I feel like I understand all that. And so, it's not that I think they're better or worse. I feel like they're just better in some situations and they definitely work worse in some situations and definitely work worse for the way some people surf, like a real back foot, you know, mm -hmm. straight up and down, real contest style, like, uh, we'll just say Adam Rapogel, he's not gonna like maybe tend to surf as well on it as right. somebody who's just going down the line. And but it's super good for like, for like that. Even like, is that a fourth thing? You're on a thruster right there. No, you are on a force. So the interesting thing though, the talk of the town is Felipe Toledo at Lowers riding a fourth and doing right. his turns. So what do you guys have to say about that? What do I have to say about that? I think he just said it all. It did. Four it's, fins, Philippe Toledo, world's best small wave surfer. That's, I just, I think town. it's really interesting because it, you know, knowing you and knowing your personality for all these years, you're very like, like, Things that you're doing, you're just doing because you want to do them. Like, this is just for me. And, like, you're, like, the reluctant influencer. Like, you don't realize it, but you're, like, influencing these generations of kids that are, like, they want to do airs. And then all of a sudden, you know, 
you know, grabbing is cool, but like now all of a sudden, it seems like, you know, since this, the cover of Surfer's Journal, since that big frontside Ollie, since the, the big Ollie you did down in- uh, The Stab High. Yeah, process. Stab High in Costa Rica, and also at the Wave Pool in Waco, like, like the Shifty is making a big comeback in, you know, instead of going for your, uh, grab slob, grab like a front side air, people are starting to, starting to turn things. And I think it's, for, and this is more of a statement than it is a question, but it's- But isn't that nice to see being it's, a skater? It's freaking form? awesome. And I think that the best thing about it is, is like being, being a reluctant influencer, oftentimes I think is like, you're not self-aware of what's happening. Cause you're just doing your own shit. You're on your own. Like this is making me happy. I'm going along this line and just watching the best parts of it fall off into society. I just think that's the freaking coolest thing. You can always tell the dudes that are like, I'm influencing a fucking generation. I'm gonna <laughs> fold my pants like this a little bit more, you know, and like just see how it falls off. I always like really gravitated towards the people that just didn't, like, you know, you're coming up in skating, you got like guys like Neil Blender. They, they don't give a shit about who they're influencing. They're just like doing it. And that, and whatever happens is gonna happen. Like, you know, there's, there's been countless, like Roach in, in snowboarding, like one of my idols, he didn't give a shit what was happening on the sidelines. I don't think he still does. No, he still, still does not. But I just think, I think that's a really refreshing, cool thing to see these days. Well, another thing too, uh, along all that, like for me, like they're like, oh, like spinning and grabbing and this and that. And like, and like I told these other guys, I'm living proof that like the straight air is the easiest in the, you know. But the thing is, I feel like, People have done a lot of things and they've spun a lot of ways and they've gotten really technical to where it's like even hard to look at in some senses. But like uh, if you do say the straighter but take it to a new level, which I don't think people have taken the straighter to the fullest potential yeah, yeah. height and control. And so like once you do that, boom, then it's gonna take the straighter to a new level. And then you can obviously follow it with like the technical side because it's like you can't go to new levels and new heights and all that without mastering your basics. Yeah, the and basics, stuff. sure. So I feel like everybody's so caught up in like doing a spin or two, whatever it is and like, and flipping. But when you do all that, it's like you go out and you know what I mean? It gets kind yeah. of crazy, which is totally rad. Um, but I feel like if there's other people trying to do stuff, it's, it's like going to help all of it. It's, and honestly, too, like if you watch things and it's like, boom, everything was a certain way. Vert was a certain way. Then it's like Danny hits the mega ramp. Now everybody, 12-year-olds hit the mega ramp. Like right. it's nothing. And so, I don't know, not that that's like the mega ramp or anything. But the fact is, is soon people like, you never thought people would do like what those guys do now when Christian was doing. Even when Christian did a stale fish. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, crazy. Now guys are doing frontside rotation, stale fish, just locked grabs, boom, mm -hmm. sticking it to where your mind would want to think that, but to see people. Yeah, it was, a, it was fantasy back yeah, then. But yeah, but like, now people execute it and you're like, wow. Yeah, so. it's it's cool to see, you know, just the, the progression. So as, as you know, the theme here is like, we're, this is like the midlife health minute. I think this is a good pivot point within this Let's get into that. conversation. So. Good, yeah, as as your uh, as your as your back goes for the snap. Okay, so now we kind of move on to like you know you you come up in skating you you know you you start to become this rising star in surfing and just well whatever action sports whatever the hell you want to call it. When we you know we grew up in a time where like it was excess and part of like the whole thing with with skating and surfing was just partying your balls off. You know, there wasn't a lot of training going on back then. So what about when it was like 20 pro snowboarders? Yeah. And you were one of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. Yeah. But then it was like before, you didn't really have to be like this. Like I was saying too, if you wanted to be a pro, you could go down to a contest at the beach, me and enter, and all of a sudden you were a pro. Yeah, because you, yeah. Or, and, or, or even the ASP, but it was, be, there was no qualifying series or nothing. It was like, oh, you just go down and all of a sudden you're a pro. Yeah, but now it's like if you don't go through all these steps, if you don't get your model, or or if you're not like just just keeping your body in in prime physical shape, because there was a time when you could you could stay up till five a.m. You could pile out and then just trail. pile into the gate or pile on into the bib and freaking win, you know that. And that was like I think that was part of also to like what kind of led to like so many people, um, you know, just living that lifestyle and embracing that lifestyle. So when, so when did that peak for you as far as like, you were like, 
you know, I, I kept going. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get into that. Like, talk about that. Oh God. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, obviously, we all grew up in a different time, and you know, when there was smoking cigarettes on the airplane and in aisle thirty or whatever it was, you know, like, mm-hmm. in the seventies and eighties, censorship wasn't quite like the cancel culture is now, and so, and you know, pe- children were meant to be seen and not heard. So you go play over there. You did whatever the hell you want over there. Okay, right. and my parents were over here and what they were barbecuing and drinking and partying, whatever they did. And it was like, what did you do? You played with lighters and f- anything you wanted. And now <laughs> it's like there's a parent over there supervising oh. those kids. And so, uh, you know, and then like obviously there was the music element. It was dry, a very you know, strong driving force in San Clemente. There's mm-hmm. multiple bands. And so going to the beach and going down and hanging out, like the guys that you would look at or, or say when guys were getting ready to go to the Iron Maiden contest or concert, they'd all go to Pochi. And so that's where my grandma lived at Pochi. And so there was a payphone at Pochi. And so basically when I was like seven and eight and nine and 10 and you know what I mean? It was I could ride my bike to the beach by myself, go hang out, and so what did I do? I went hung out with all the kids who were getting ready to go party, and so by the time I was 12, I was out of school, and so those guys were already my friends. So my friends all had cars because that's how I could get around, and so I'd have to wait for my friends to get out of high school to come pick me up when I was in junior high. Uh, so I was influenced a lot by older people and surrounding environment, and then heavy metal kicked in and what comes with heavy metal and uh, yeah heavy life totally yeah and so i mean uh you know party and punk rock uh then you know obviously my brother's christian fletcher and he's you know uh spring chicken (laughs) so you know there's a long line you know my parents were addicts alcoholics growing up and you know they quit when i was five my brother was 10, but they lived a rock star lifestyle because mm-hmm. being a surf star, it's a little different than a rock star, but you get treated the same in some senses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know, yeah. So I ended up doing all that and I thought that I was the same way and gonna live it. But I lived through it and I'm here to tell the tale. I wouldn't wish drug abuse or addiction upon my worst enemy because it is no joke. Um, for some reason, that party rock style life, you look at and you think, oh, how exciting, the coolest guys are rad, they party, they do this, you know, look at Lemmy, yeah, Motorhead, you know what mm-hmm. I mean, like he can do it. So, told myself I needed to change, and I said the only way I'm gonna change is if I have a family and people to care about and somebody else besides myself to think about, because all those things were just total selfish indulgence behaviors, not one thought about anybody else, not one thought about the rep- rep- repercussions it had on myself, my parents, my friends, my mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. And so I got sober and then uh, I got my wife pregnant. She was, you know, been with through me with all that, you know. And so it was like, oh, it was like a shaky time. I mean, obviously, but then I knew I had to move. And so I was like, okay, I, I had all these things and I go, okay, I got to get sober. We're going to have a family and I'm going to move away from uh, all my memories and my childhood friends and all the shit that makes me like think about doing this stuff. Yeah. And so um, that was when I just, you know, we moved to Hawaii and had kids. And it's so like I started recovering a little bit before then, but it's definitely kind of kicked in. You're always in recovery. Yeah. And uh, but the fact is, I'm so thankful every day just to be normal and to have my family and to have made it through it. And all those other things like we talk about, like surfing and whatever, everything, it's really nothing compared to just being able to uh, have the confidence of sobriety and know that you put your whole heart into your family and your friends and your life and yeah. to live a, a solid, clean life. Like All that other stuff is just a joke. You're just fooling yourself and... and um, if you realize that while you're still alive, you're you're really lucky because um, I have a lot of friends, obviously, that have died. Of, I mean, not even going into all that, but to live at 100% is like what you'd say is 100%. You're living at 0% in the minuses. Like truly living 100% is being 100% like clear headed mm-hmm. and you know all that. And so I'm just so thankful to have come out on the other side. 
and if anybody can like get the information from me that like don't think you're cool by trying to be cool like take like I always say, oh jocks this and that those guys are kooks you know like oh, I'll never be a jock <laughs> and then you're like oh they just kind of had it figured out they exercise they take care of themselves they do sports they go to sleep on time mm -hmm. like, or actually sleep at all <laughs> yeah. and so I was like they actually had it figured out and I'm so dumb I'm sitting there pointing my finger at the people that are already that I've become. I think that's, it's like... But it's like, you, anything you hate, you're going to become. Just right. <laughs> it, it just seems like, too, like, you know, the whole jock thing. Like, growing up as a skater, you're always like, fuck the jocks. But yeah. it was like, it was a, just another label that someone put on, you know, it doesn't matter the sport. And it's like, it's more like, like you're saying, like, these people actually just, they want to continue doing what they're doing. So they're just, you know keeping the car lubed up and, and tuned yeah. up, you know? Yeah, they clean their car, they have a nice center console, it's right. like they put their stuff in the trunk, fold it, they wipe their feet up, yeah. Yeah. On you're that, like, no, fuck that, let's get it on, yeah. throw the skateboards and ah. Uh. On yeah. that note though, I mean, as you are aging, we're all aging, to continue to perform at the level you perform at, can you run through, whether it's meditation, yoga, what is your process to like, okay. to surf and stay? But I'm gonna actually go back to the other thing, yeah. because if you don't go through all that stuff, you never have. Can't get to the. You can't, so if you yeah. never go to the dark, if you never see the devil like with your own eyes and feel him, hear him and fucking run from him, then you never can really like feel the light. Right. Because you've always just went like this, you know what I mean? And so. Just going like that is like the perfect way to do it, but if you're not like that, at least you want to come up. So if you've seen the darkness, because I truly believe in my own eyes, I have seen right. and felt. And, and so yeah, when you see the devil and you're running from him, that's when you you know it's time to like be normal. And so now we're gonna go on to your next question because I didn't finish. So Nathan, we were discussing your process now in middle age, staying fit. I just want to know what your routine is, whether it's breathing, med meditation, stretching. Give us your process. Um, well, it's a very interesting process and it all so remember I told you I broke my leg on January third, two thousand nine. Yes. So on uh, January 3rd, 2019, I told myself I was gonna change my life. But I didn't know why January third was such an important day to me. So then I told myself I'm going to do stretching and breathing or apnea because I started an apnea training before that because I want to be able to smoke cigarettes and uh, hold my breath for a really long time. Who doesn't? So I <laughs> thought that, that would be, uh, would be fair then. You know? <laughs> yeah. the most There's trade-offs. The you most talked about trade-offs. I've ever heard in my life. I want to be able to smoke cigs and hold my breath for a super long time. So then I got into apnea. And so then going into apnea, then you do all these tables and you hold, you breathe up for two minutes, hold for two, whatever. So, uh, and then, so stretching and breathing is yoga, I guess. Is, so that's the word that they call that. So I got into the apnea, but then I was, I was working out, um, and I was super stiff, but I, I don't know anything about any of this stuff. And so like, I tried to go on a run and then tripped and like totally scraped myself worse than like, <laughs> worse, worse than a Yogi. So I was like, maybe that's not my deal. I'm not really a runner. Um, <laughs> And so I just, I'm really stiff. And so I just told myself, I'm just going to stick to, uh, you know, really focusing on breathing and trying to get more flexible and then posture. And so getting into all that stuff, I, it just really helps with your relaxation. And so through that, I've learned to touch my toes. How long, it, like, it, this is, this is, is this is a sticking point with me because I always gauge like how right how good I'm doing. <laughs> like when can, when was the last time I actually could like really touch my toes? Oh. Like, I can force it in the shower now and then, like if I get warm. <laughs> but it took a year for you to be able to touch your toes. Well, it's weird because like if you do that, you're not doing it. But then I were ah. Oh, but then I learned if you take like a couple deep breaths and then hold it, you don't even try and stretch. You just hold it and let your air stretch your body and then when you blow out you relax and kind of hunch over mm -hmm. so that's kind of me stretching it's like oh and so whatever i'm not really forcing anything but through time if you do it for six months you're going to see a great difference in like your flexibility in your hips or whatever it is so oh, i'm so jealous of those people that are just like oh yeah they just put their hands flat on the floor in front of them i'm like when you see a person squat like an indo squat it drives me nuts oh and they bend down to do something and they just comfortably get right. down and do something and they get 
Like for me, like the, I'm just a hunch no matter what. But the case is, is then I learned about this yoga stuff and then Tai Chi and then apnea. And so all three of those things relate to your breath. So Tai Chi is you're moving on your breath and yoga is you're moving on your breath. But all those things are to get into meditation. And so when I learned the breath being so important and so overlooked was like they say, oh, if you don't eat for so long, you know, then you're going to die at this many days. And if you don't drink water or have any fluids at this many days, you die. And so it's like, oh, but if you don't breathe in two minutes, you die. But we do it automatically. And so uh, we don't ever really look at our breath or our breathing patterns. So then once you start getting into your breathing pattern and going into your breath, that changes your consciousness or your conscious level, just like if you drink alcohol, which starves your body of oxygen. Um, and so, yeah, you get high on it the opposite way. And what it does is it gives you things like takes away your anxiety or takes away your, your stress or lets you have better focus on, you know, something in your life. So um, I don't do it to... Uh, talk about it or to, yeah. to tell people I do it every morning just by myself at around 3.30 in the morning and about 3 to 30 to 5 in the morning and so I don't take any time away from my family or nothing and what it does is just makes it so the rest of my day goes nice. So, is it habit now? That yeah, it's habit. And so usually I wake up and do a bunch of breathing for like an hour, different kinds, you know, and then usually in the morning in the sun. I'll do like more stretching and like a routine, but what I'm what I've been into is like a lot of handstands, um, and postures, and I feel like handstands are really good because they make your whole body stiff, and then when you get it just perfect, you can lock into this certain position where it takes no um, stress. But what it does is makes your toes all the way to your fingers flex, and mm -hmm. so. Um, I believe like hanging on things and handstands and wall sits and kind of like core strength posture breathing techniques is what I like. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like I'm really good at it. I just wake up and do it every day for myself. And so I've been doing this, right? Like I told you, January 3rd, broke my leg. And then I've been doing this stretching and breathing for a year. And I was like, God, I wonder when I started that. I tried to narrow it down. And then Kendall, Gavin's wife, came into the yoga class. And what day did it start? It started January 3rd. And from that day, we did a week of yoga. And then I just didn't stop. And so then the next year, I was trying to think. And I was like, oh, that was January 3rd. And I was like, why is that day so important in my life? And I was like, oh, I broke my leg that day. Ten years prior to the day, I started doing breathing and stretching. And so then... It came up, I was going to have been doing, because on, uh, and then I started the meditation, because you got to get your body ready to be able to sit there and relax, I guess, but I don't know, I mean, this, I was just doing it, so then I got into the meditation and breathing and stretching, and then it was going to be January 3rd, it would be my second year, and so January 3rd, I didn't do much on my second year, so January 4th, I went down to the beach, down the pipeline, and uh, Nellie was on the beach, and I threw my keys, and I went out surfing. And boom, I went out and caught this wave, and it was, uh, and I did this air, and it was that air, right? And so, when I came in, they're like, oh, this and that. And so, I don't know what it has done for me, but on the second year to the day, almost, of the anniversary, like, I did that. And so, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't even feel like I did that. It was like, oh, I just did an air. It felt big, and I looked around, and when I was up in the air, cool, landed, like, on the <laughs> But then I just came in like, oh, it wasn't really a big deal. I was just found that like it was super crowded and nice out. And uh, so the interesting part is that was like a two year anniversary air that I did mm -hmm. for. So it wasn't to anybody else, but to myself. It was like, well, that was crazy that like, so when you're like, oh, people are, how are you doing it? How, you know, like this and that, like, I didn't even do it. I didn't even mean to do it. I just did it. But the fact was it was on, on these dates. And so it, it had to all, it's like part of the healing process. And so it started, the healing started and then it was like this air happened. And so those were like personal signs that like, okay, you're on the right track. You made the right choice. You're doing the right thing. Just keep doing that. Like, so it's kind of like a, a personal affirmation. I think it's pretty interesting what we were talking before just about how you're like, I'm into stretching, I'm into breathing. I think that's called yoga, whatever. And I, I think that, that that's a super interesting point because yoga's got so much shit attached to it. Like where when you think about like, oh, I do yoga. Well, I immediately think about like a bunch of uh, just self-absorbed uh, self douchebags, you know, kind of just 
Uh, a yoga. Talking, uh, uh, coffee. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, like, and like like her pants. But I love I love like the way you've broken it down to like the Ross form. So another interesting point on that is so the only other person I know in the action sports industry that does it besides Jerry Lopez is Terry A. Hawkinson, right? Mm-hmm. So I see him, I'm like, Terry A, fuck, what's that? What are you into the breathing and the yoga? And he's like, oh, oh like I don't know, you know, and I was like, like, I do it every day. And I'm like, you know, trying to get a read on it. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't like, you know, the whole thing. He's like, people call me from Yoga Journal and I won't do interviews and this and that. He's all, the reason I do it though is because I want to surf and uh, snowboard and play soccer at my best. And so he's all, I do the same. And he's all, so anybody that I'm, that's my friends like me or like somebody else that surfs or does whatever, Mm -hmm. he's all, anybody that I, come across like them, I tell them, okay, you gotta do it. And he's all, all you need to learn is the sun salutation, which is nine moves and nine breaths, right? And he's all, cause you think of yoga, you gotta like be on one hand on fucking whatever, <laughs> the edge of a cliff or yeah. whatever. Like. So he broke it down like that and he's all, Nathan, the sun salutation is basically your ollie. And he's all, just work on that for like a year and master your ollie. He's all, once you get your ollie, then you can start doing grabs and spinning or whatever you're doing. He's all, but just work on the sun salutation and get that mastered. And I was like, okay. So for me, that really made a lot of sense. Okay, the sun salutation is your ollie. So basically, if you can do that, you can go into all these other things. And then once you do that, you just add your own stuff. But you really learn the motion of just going in and out, in and out, because it's just back and forth. You know, that's the sickest analogy. That's a good, great yeah. analogy. It it's makes unreal. it. It makes it sound really awesome. Yeah, and I don't just put that bumper sticker on my yeah. car or any of that bullshit. Or you know, yeah. There you go. Just it's do great, it. Great, dude. So, but that's another thing too. Is he's like a real genius, you know, Terry, and he's obviously like done what he's done. And so when somebody like that breaks it down in a common sense way that like you can understand, you're like, oh yeah, okay, let's just learn our ollie and we'll go from there. We'll, we'll practice that for a year. And so. The end sentence for me is all that's going to do is just help you. And the reason I do it, um, breathing, stretching, and then like whatever, push-ups, handstands, all that stuff, is because I told myself I'm 43 or whatever years old at that time. Uh, When I'm 53 and 63, I'm going to be a certain way. And so if you paddle and surf and paddle and surf and maybe skate a little bit and kind of take care of whatever, 63, you're going to be having kind of a hard time, you know? But... Maybe even just going to the restroom, getting out of your chair, 70 years old. But if you do something every day of your life, like it's work, like you're going to job, you're supporting your family, but this is like you're supporting your mental and your skeletal and all that. Mm -hmm. But if you do that, when you get to 60 years old or 70 years old, your body is going to be so much more prime and so much better because you've used it a little bit every day. And so there was the one guy said too, he's off. You take your hand and do this a thousand times a day for one month. You do that every day for a thousand times. He's all at the end of the month. Your hand's going to work so much better. All right. So it's that's just, a great way to look at it. I and to just sort of to piggy tail to where you're at now. Obviously, we have the surfing. You're everything you're doing. You're you're right in the middle of it. You're as relevant as you've ever been, and I would argue much more so. And one of the biggest things I've noticed just watching from the outside is how fatherhood has changed you. The Laser and Jetson show is on YouTube and it's the sickest thing ever. I have a six and eight year old and they watch your boys and they get pumped, they get hyped. Can you just talk about your boys a little bit and how fatherhood has changed you as a man? Well, it definitely has changed me and I set it up to change me because I needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. Um, So thank the Lord for that. But it, uh, you know, in a sense of like the Laser and Jetson show, I grew up like with my dad doing Wave Warriors and all that. And to be honest, I haven't seen one childhood stardom figure, any of that ever be of a adult success. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's pretty much uh, guaranteed a sinking ship. And, and I'm well aware of that. And so for me, I'm dealing with my family. I'm putting them on TV. But the reason I'm doing it is because I've had to watch this YouTube stuff and see the people on there and watch them open toys and presents and the way they talk. And it's like so painfully, like mentally, it's just crazy. And then you're watching your kid who you want to have this, you know, be mentally like turned on and be out, whatever, be stimulated by cool information. And then he's sitting there watching some 
kid unravel a, uh, unravel a toy <laughs> egg. The worst. And you're just like, oh. And so I was like, and I watched it enough to where I was like, there has to be something better than this. And I was like, you know what? There's not. And I'm like, okay, I got to do something about this. And the only way I could do it is use me and my family and my research of what I saw for these children that is just unbelievable. Um, and so I said, you know what? I'm going to try and make a show with my family. We're going to put it out there. Uh, and But at least do something to try and make the kids mentally, physically more healthy, stronger, go outside, see their parents engaging with them because that's what we, you know what I mean? So Absolutely. So my point was, was like, God, oh, this is miserable. This is going to take your soul. But at the same time, it's going to make so many people's lives and hopefully make kids' childhoods better with their parents. And so I said right there, that's worth putting every, your whole heart out on the line for the world if you're making uh, humanity better. And so uh, that was really the turning point where I was like, you know what? I got to do something with my family because we can, you know, maybe mm -hmm. make a difference in people's mm -hmm. lives. And, even if it's gonna cause pain and whatever in our own lives, I think we can all get through. <laughs> Take them up the team, well, the society as a whole. I, you hit the you hit the mark though. It's it's it. When I watch it, I feel like I'm a kid again, and I see the joy and I see the love coming through from the parents and the enjoyment the kids that are having. It's awesome and I suggest anybody watch the show on YouTube and I can't wait to see how these kids develop and and it's really cool thank you for putting that out and showing the world that yeah and that's another thing too I, I don't really care I don't have like a dead set way that they're gonna develop and like I said before as long as they're having fun and playing and being outdoors and with their friends and surfing and skating not that that's the end result but like for mm -hmm. me that's what I it just mm -hmm. there's just nothing more fun you can go to Magic Mountain and or get a barrel and you tell me which one you had more fun in. Barrel. <laughs> so, I don't know. I just I just hope that uh, in the end, everything goes good and, and it's perceived like how you perceived it. And it doesn't, not at the cost of the mental health of my family and children. Yeah. Uh, awesome. <laughs> well, I, the jury's still out. Of <laughs> the jury's still out. <laughs> Nathan, you're an open book. We appreciate you being here and taking the time. Um, I'm so excited to see what happens with this man in the future, with his family. You can follow him on Instagram. He's currently on the cover of Surfer's Journal. Doing big front side ollies. There's not much more you can say uh, in surfing. Go ahead. <laughs> like my friend told me, his boss said, he's like, Mitchie. Let me just tell you, you're 50 years old, your life's half over, and this isn't the good half. <laughs> so I was like, damn. I was like, oh. harsh realm. <laughs> so my words are if you take care of yourself, enjoy yourself from 50 to whatever could be the best half. If you don't 100%. have that normal job and normal life and that normal structure, and if you have that normal structure, just have a different outlook on it. It's a mind, yeah. it's a mindset, man. And, and, whether you know it or not, you inspire so many people just by being who you are, and you're continuing to do that. And it's been an honor having you as a guest. Cool, thank you. Thank it's you so honor. much for being here. And now it's time, <laughs> <laughs> it's time for our products. It's time for our products. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. New Greens. You're if you awesome. like drinking salad, or if you just vegetables are too hard to stomach, or fruits and whatever, and you like stuff in powder form. New Greens, superfood mix. It'll make your life better, and they're the ones that are keeping the lights on. Oh, yeah. Mmm, banana. Mmm, give me some kale. Mmm, I like them sweet potatoes. Mmm, lax and chia. Oh, yeah, give me some blueberries. Oh, yeah, yummy. Mmm, super berry. 10% of your New Greens purchases goes to charities that help those in need.